tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, podcast episode number 223, Missile No, segment, intro, and host welcome. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about reaping revenge and baited bullies. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Stay tuned after the second story for a big Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast announcement. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Nick Carlson and Richard Morgan are voice talents Justine Anastasia, Daniel Hewitt, Eric Peabody, Michelle Kane, Olivia Steele, Nick Goroff, Jeff Sturtevant, and Kevin Barberi. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to... Turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale this evening is written by Nick Carlson and is performed by Justine Anastasia. When the hell did they let her out? Hello, anybody? Well, as I was saying, our first tale this evening is written by Nick Carlson and is performed by Justine Anastasia, Daniel Hewitt, Eric Peabody, Michelle Kane, Olivia Steele, and Nick Goroff. In it, we meet a woman heartbroken for the holidays, a situation I hope none of us ever find ourselves in. Now, without further ado, I present to you... The Fourth Ghost. For the first time in her nearly 68 years, Ruth Sterling was looking to Christmas with crippling, heart-wrenching dread. She could still remember everything from that fateful day, almost exactly one month ago. The kitchen was bursting with flavorful aromas, sweet potatoes, roasted apples, spinach and feta quiche, pumpkin pie cheesecake, and a rosemary-encrusted butterball turkey. It almost formed a haze throughout the house, one sweet and savory, where a mere whiff would transport someone back to the cozy Thanksgiving evenings of their childhoods. Animated chatter with family, no school or work to attend the next day, just good food and good company serenaded by a crackling fire. This Thanksgiving would be special for Ruth. Her youngest daughter had just had her baby, and she had only seen pictures of little Jason. I can't wait for you to meet him, was all Allison had been telling her mother when she called for the past two months. He smiles so much for a kid his age. At five o'clock, Ruth set all the food on the kitchen table, ensuring that everything would be ready by the time the family arrived. Her table only sat six. The two kids would have to settle with folding tables and chairs in the corners. 
and of course, little Jason would be passed back and forth between Allison and Ruth. He was her first kid, and Ruth knew she'd need the burden taken off her. At 5.30, the smells were a little less fragrant, and the food was approaching room temperature. Not to worry, Ruth would just heat everything up in the oven when they drove up. At 6, she was starting to get concerned. All her phone calls went straight to voicemail. Service was spotty in the mountains she lived in. That had to have been it. Not to worry. Too much. At 7, they knocked on the door. Ruth sprung from her easy chair, nearly knocking over her premature glass of brandy, and almost threw it open in her excitement. She had never seen the man standing on the doorstep before. But even in the gloomy, cold evening light, she saw the silver badge glint on his chest. Ruth Sterling? Her lip trembled. Yes, that's me. Her Christmas Eve was winding up, similar to her Thanksgiving in some respects. There was a fire in the hearth, but it had long crumbled into ember and ash. She also had a glass of brandy, but it was her third, and the drink had threatened to overflow with each pour. Other than that, the difference was night and day, and her very soul had been swallowed by night. Every good thing in her life was snuffed out in seconds. She couldn't bear to absorb the details, but she could easily imagine it, having been around the block a few times herself. Crunching, twisting metal, some screaming, maybe some fire. The officers had told her they would have barely felt anything before passing on. That was the term they'd used. That was hardly a consolation. The agony Ruth felt was mind-shredding. A primal, psychic bellow that pierced her ears and rattled her organs. It had been like this every day since the accident. Grief manifested as silent, internal screaming, suppressed only by the dull fog of alcohol. And what had become of the piece-of-shit bastard fuck who'd been driving the other car? Who had slammed on the brakes and swerved to avoid hitting a deer? causing the big green family minivan to swerve and spin out, right as they were crossing a bridge over a major interstate. Jail wasn't good enough for that motherfucker. Death wasn't good enough. Ruth cried and hurled her half-empty glass into the hearth. Glass shattered and flames spat that singed the carpet, but they sputtered out seconds later, leaving her cocooned in darkness. They were dead violently snatched away, broken and mangled beyond recognition. The police had told her to not look at the bodies. That was enough of an image for her. Christmas was now an insult. Merry-making and togetherness. There would be no merry-made, and togetherness was a joke. Somewhere outside, the distant noise of a door-to-door -door choir sounded off. Ruth shook her head and pressed her palms to her ears. She would have to pretend to ignore the inevitable knock on the door. She doubted she could even rise from her chair on account of the alcohol turning her legs to jelly and her mind to fog. This isn't Christmas. Not what it's meant to be. The drunken fog became a solid, vaporous wall that pressed in on her, and she slumped in her chair her body still weakly convulsing from her grief. Thankfully, the predicted knock on the door didn't rouse her from her slumber. Fragmented dreams tinted with pained love filled the void. Something did wake her up, though. It was as if she were never asleep. Her eyes shot open, and she was immediately on high alert. The cold struck her first a deathly chill that seemed to color the air a faded dark blue. The hearth was black as pitch, not an ember in sight. Ruth shivered, arms huddled around her bony frame, 
her breath emitting in misty spurts. She remembered drinking a lot of brandy in a vain attempt to drown her sorrows. She had settled in her chair, determined to shun the carolers if they decided to stop by, and no, that was it. She remembered everything. No additional antics conveyed in a drunken stupor. Her head was clear, too, which was also strange. Three glasses of brandy, a nap well into the night, and not an inkling of nausea or hangover? Ruth had been making herself sick every morning since Thanksgiving from drinking. What was different this time? She glanced at the old clock above the window, and she screamed. A hulking figure cloaked in shadow stood near the window, illuminated in the sifting pale moonlight. Its scalp nearly scraped the ceiling, and its face was well above the moonbeam. But Ruth could see its ornate black cloak with accents of green and purple. She trembled from fear and cold, averting her eyes from the apparition. Our Father, who art in heaven, she whispered. But her throat locked up, and her brain spun. She couldn't finish it. It sputtered and died in her dry lips. My prayers are useless, she thought. This thing is going to take me. Lord on high, deliver me. The figure raised its arms. Long skeletal hands gleamed tombstone gray. But as it shifted, a familiar, timely, yet unexpected noise accompanied it. Ruth's shaking subsided. She perked her head up. Jingle bells? Hark. The apparition's voice was female, rich and soothing, yet steely, like a mug of hot cocoa brewed from dark chocolate. "'Tis the morn of a most wondrous Christmas day, Ruth Sterling. Yet I sense you have been poisoned with grief." Befuddled and awestruck, Ruth finally forced herself to look at the figure. She noticed now the silvery bells adorning the spirit's sleeves and cuffs, which tinkled softly with each of her subtle breaths. Her face, however, remained hidden in shadow. You have no idea what I've been through. I've seen it many times before. Tragedy of insufferable degree. It calls to me, especially on this hour of Christmas morning. Ruth stared up at the clock. It read 4 a.m. What are you? You're a demon, aren't you? No. Vanity and perversion are not in our nature. But we minister separately from the castes of angels. I am called the ghost of Christmas meant to be. Something stirred in the depths of Ruth's mind. Like a Christmas carol? I am one of many ghosts of Christmas. The character Scrooge never lived to see another Christmas, and therefore, to have the chance to invoke me. You might say, I'm the fourth ghost. Christmas meant to be. I have visited many before you. And I will greet many more today before the sun rises. I appear for the stricken and disappointed. The disillusioned. The souls despairing for their ideal vision of Christmas Day. And for that one day, I alleviate their despair. Ruth's heart jumped. Electric blood coursed through her body. My ideal Christmas is to see my family again. My children, their spouses, their children. Christmas is nothing without them. I can give that to you. Ruth inhaled. Her hand gripping the armrest began to shake. It was impossible. As she told herself, they were dead, snatched away. No coming back from where they'd been banished to. 
Yet, this Yuletide ghost knew her name, knew her pain. That, too, had seemed impossible. For one day? Already, she knew it wouldn't be enough, and it would be a front against all that she believed. Death, horrible as it was, was the first step to the kingdom beyond, to bring them back, to delay their judgment, their eternal sojourn in paradise. It seemed to some extreme degree unholy. But where was God on that Thanksgiving night, she asked herself. If God could challenge her with the brutal death of her living family, surely he'd forgive this brief transgression into temptation. She tasted brandy in her mouth, felt its intoxicating shroud around her skull, warm and fuzzy. She wanted it again, everywhere. Give me my family back. Many have come to hate me after living through their Christmas meant to be. Many have fallen into deeper despair in the following days. Some have not lived to see another. Is this what you want? I want to see my family. I want a Christmas with them. The spirit stepped closer to Ruth, who looked up at her. A thin black veil fell over her face, but Ruth could see the spirit's eyes. Like a deer's, black obsidian pits of mystery and elegance. She lifted her hand over Ruth's head. The jingling bells were a sonata of ice and glass. Know my power. Know my grace. And you shall come to see the pure, enduring vision of your Christmas meant to be. Grandma, it's Christmas! Ruth stirred in her chair. Her head was like a pressure cooker, and it felt like there was a brick in her stomach. Ugh, serves me right for drinking into the night. Grandma, are you really gonna sleep all day? Aiden, keep your voice down. Mom, did you fall asleep down here? Ruth's eyelids wavered. She lifted her head, wincing against the stiffened muscles in her neck. Thomas? Merry Christmas, Mom. Thomas, her eldest son, swum into her vision, wearing an ugly sweater and a Santa hat. Stuart's cooking breakfast. Ruth breathed in, smelling bacon and burnt eggs. Her second eldest son never quite learned the secret to cooking eggs. She'd fly out of her chair and show him the right way, if she weren't so hungover. The events of the night before hit her. She gasped. Mom, are you all right? His eyes grew wide. Is his cooking that bad? Ruth's chest heaved. You, you're really here, right? Thomas grasped his mother's hand. His was warm and rough with calluses. She could feel him, his flesh, his body heat, the faint nervous pulse between his thumb and forefinger. Mom, seriously, are you okay? Ruth could only nod. Dad, is Grandma all right? Tina, Thomas's daughter, poked her head into the room. I'm fine, sweetheart. Just had some bad dreams. Ruth said to her with a smile. She had to force herself to say the next sentence. Where's Allison? Upstairs with Greg and the baby. Should I get him? No. If they're busy, they can wait. Go help your brother. Ruth waved her hand. Thomas smiled and fled for the kitchen to try and salvage Stuart's egg catastrophe. She glanced around. White morning light streamed through the window. A fire crackled merrily in the hearth. The tree was bursting with ornaments and tinsel. Tina and Aiden knelt underneath it, nosing through the pile of presents spilling out from under it. Ruth didn't remember setting up the tree this year. Nor was her family alive, for that matter. 
It's true, she realized. It's really happening. My perfect Christmas. Someone came down the stairs. Good morning, Mom. Allison was as bright and glowing as Ruth remembered. And Merry Christmas from Jason. The little newborn in her arms tossed weakly, throwing up a hand that settled on his mother's shoulder. A smile finally cracked Ruth's face. It hurt her cheeks from lack of use. Tears welling, she held out her hands, and Allison transferred the infant to Ruth. The little baby's eyes were still shut from sleepiness. He cooed and buried his face above Ruth's chest. He's beautiful, was all Ruth said. He's all right, Allison smirked. No, he's beautiful. Ruth smiled. Thank you. Sure thing, Mom. Allison took Jason back. You okay? Bad dreams. Feels like the last month or so has been a bad dream. Well... Allison said with a hint of concern. We're all here on Christmas. The bad dream's over. She smiled again, rocking Jason. Ruth nodded. It is, isn't it? Christmas morning went by. There was no other word for it. Perfectly. A Christmas story played on the TV in a constant loop. The grandkids ripped their presents open like a well-oiled machine, the pile of toys behind them precariously growing. Greg had gotten Allison a silver necklace. Katie, Thomas's wife, had to take him outside to show him the brand new charcoal grill she had gifted him. And Stuart prepared Bloody Marys for the adults, each one adorned with blue cheese stuffed olives. Food, not so much, but drinks he could nail. Ruth could sense her hangover siphoning away with each sip of her drink. By 11 a.m., she felt completely refreshed and recharged. Hey, there's one more! Aiden picked up a package the size of a shoebox from behind the tree. It says Ruth Sterling on it. That's Grandma to you, Aiden. Who's it from? I don't know. It's blank. Aiden swiveled it in his grasp. Santa brought it then. Tina looked around at the adults, but all seemed just as intrigued as her. Aiden rushed the present up to Ruth and ran back to his toy pile. Ruth examined it. It was immaculately wrapped, not a seam or tear in sight, better than even she could have done. The paper was purple and green. Seriously, who's this from? But all she received were blank stares and shrugs. Ruth shook her head and tore it open. A plain box lay underneath. She removed the lid and peered inside. The chill from the night returned. Nestled within the package was a single silver bell. She looked back up at her family. All eyes were on her. She expected them to vanish, or horribly, to collapse into burning, twisted skeletons. The day would be over in mere hours. Everything would be gone. Mom, what's inside? There's nothing. Did one of you knuckleheads just give me an empty box? She asked the grandkids. Nuh-uh. I remember everything I wrapped. You couldn't even remember the capital of the U.S. They continued to bicker, and Thomas had to break them up threatening to withhold their Christmas cookies if they kept acting out. Ruth set the box down next to her chair, and the rest of the family had forgotten it within minutes. But it resonated in her mind as a distant alarm, warning of sunset, nighttime, and the end of her perfect Christmas. She closed her eyes and breathed through her nose. Enjoy it, she told herself. Just enjoy it. Snow began to fall at around three in the afternoon. The grandkids played outside, supervised by Thomas, Katie, and Stuart. Greg, Allison, and Ruth prepared supper, a sumptuous leg of lamb with potatoes and roasted asparagus. 
By 5.30, darkness had fallen, and the family moved to the dining room to enjoy their supper. Ruth looked around at her happy, healthy family, a close image of what Thanksgiving would have been, including garland wrapped around the doorway. Katie and the kids went to decorate cookies after dinner. The rest of the adults enjoyed a glass of wine and a black-and-white movie on the TV. Alistair Sim as Scrooge was pleading with Michael Hordern as Jacob Marley, cowering under his collar as the spirit emitted his ghostly bellows. Ruth winced, unable to look at the screen. Can we switch over to something else? Stuart looked at her. Why? Please. Stuart's brow furrowed, but he changed the channel to a Christmas story, on repeat for the eighth time that day. Thomas leaned over to his mother. What's the matter? Seriously, you were acting strange this morning. Now this? Ruth shook her head. She barely absorbed what he had said, but his troubled tone was more than enough. The spirit's idea of a perfect Christmas wasn't entirely accurate. She realized that if she acted like something was off, the visions of her family the spirit had conjured up would react to her accordingly. What would happen if she told them the truth? Would she spend the rest of her perfect Christmas shunned by her disbelieving family? Mom. Drop it, Thomas. Thomas drew away, scowling, and turned back to the TV. A little too much holiday spirit, maybe. Stuart offered, flicking his wine glass. I'm not drunk. Ruth sat up straight. Stuart cringed, his eyes apologetic. Sheesh, I'm sorry, Mom. It was a joke. No, I'm sorry. Ruth simmered down and sank back into her chair. Let's just enjoy the rest of our night, please. The snow continued to fall outside. Ralphie was saying, Oh, fudge, yet again. The rest of the family sat in silence, the kids arguing about proper gumdrop button placement in the kitchen. Ruth glanced at the clock. 7.30, it read. In the time it could take her to drive across state lines, everything would be gone. She downed the rest of her wine. She decided she would not see the end of the day sober. At 11.30... Everyone was in bed save for Ruth and Allison. The baby had woken up briefly, but Greg had been there to put him back to sleep. Ruth felt heavy and full as Allison put the last piece of firewood in the hearth, the flames reaching up to consume it. She sat back with her mother, both enjoying the late evening serenity. This was a good Christmas, Mom. The best I've had in a long time. I'm glad. A log collapsed in the fireplace. Sparks flew up and dissipated. The clock ticked less than a half hour into misery. Allison yawned. Well, that's it for me, I think. She stood up. I'll see you in the morning. Ruth grabbed her wrist. Don't go. She looked down at her mother. Why? What's wrong? Sit down, please. Allison did as she was told, her eyebrows scrunched with worry. What is it? Allison. Ruth took a deep breath. What if I told you that after midnight, you all went away? Allison cocked her head. Where would we go? Just somewhere I would never see you again. We're not going anywhere tonight, Mom. Allison pursed her lips. Ruth sighed. She couldn't tell anyone. She couldn't pierce this illusion. She loved it. And she hated it. Okay, then just sit with me until I fall asleep. Please. Allison shifted closer to Ruth, wrapping her in a hug. I'm so sorry something's bothering you, Mom. But I love you. And I had a great day with you and everyone. Ruth nodded. She lightly grasped her daughter's hand. 
Her eyes closed, held shut by tears. Her heart felt heavy and painful in her throat. It was going, going, going. Allison's warmth and the heat from the fire serenaded her. She felt herself drift off. Going, going, going. Ruth awoke in her chair. The room was pitch black. No Christmas tree, no piles of presents. Not even the ghost's unnatural chill. The clock read 5.36 a.m. The hangover was back. The pain overtook her. Ruth hunched in her chair, face in her hands, and wept. Gone. All that had been over 11 months ago. In scarcely a year, Ruth Sterling's house had become nearly unrecognizable. The paint was peeling off the exterior walls. The lawn and bushes were overgrown, almost jungle-like. The mailbox was stuffed with bills, flyers, and HOA notices. The place might as well have been abandoned for decades. The interior was even worse. A ghastly stench poisoned the air of excrement and spoiled food. Stains flared across the floor, walls, and ceilings like a malignant skin condition. Furniture had been toppled over. Lights flickered throughout the rooms. The hearth was stark and cold, a film of dried ash plastering the exterior. But Ruth Sterling herself was still around. She had spent much of her December in the kitchen, rolling out cylinders of cookie dough, cutting them out into haphazard shapes. The electricity in the kitchen had gone out weeks earlier, but that didn't stop her from producing batch after batch and sending them into the oven. They merely sat there, raw and stale, the ones at the bottom of the pile growing mold. When she ran out of oven trays, Ruth settled with books, container lids, and anything that was flat enough to hold a few or more cookies. After all, everything had to be perfect for Christmas Day in less than six hours. She would see her family again and have all the homemade Christmas cookies in the world for them. If the ghost appeared for her again. Ruth cursed to herself, jabbing the freshest sheet of dough with a cookie cutter, reflecting on the time passed since last Christmas when that wretched apparition had given her so much, then mercilessly taken it away. At first, she thought she'd be fine. The new year came and went, and she found herself missing her family, but her perfect Christmas had seemed enough. As the snow melted into a blooming spring, Ruth finally left the house to meet up with old friends and colleagues, eager to inform them about her amazing Christmas with her family. When met with concerned looks, Ruth happily explained how the ghost of Christmas meant to be visited her at 4 a.m. that holiday morning and gave her what she was so despaired of. When asked for proof, Ruth scoured her house for the silver bell in the box, but it had vanished from its spot next to her chair. She informed her friends that even though she couldn't find any physical evidence, they had to believe that she had been visited by the ghost who had given her that silver bell as a reminder that it wouldn't last forever. Around that time, her friends stopped talking to her. By summer, Ruth's temper had hit levels she had never known in her life. She stopped showering and washing her clothes. The heat seemed to inflame her anger and aggravate the bad smells wafting from her house. She could feel her insides putrefying, becoming nasty and gelatinous. She drank to disinfect the rot. Then September rolled around. Someone had rang her doorbell, an oddity considered no one really visited her anymore. The young lady at the door was a perky blonde, all fake smiles and ginned-up attitude. Good morning, ma'am. She nobly ignored Ruth's decrepit state. I'm here with Lush Brand Beauty, 
to tell you about our newest line of skincare products. They'll bring you back to your glory years. She held out a package. It was roughly the size of a shoebox, colored green and purple. And maybe you can bring back more. She added with a twisted grin. Ruth only remembered cursing and screaming and slamming the door in the young woman's face, fleeing to the kitchen for her next bottle of bourbon. As the days unfolded, Ruth was told that her manic door slamming had forced the saleswoman to fall backward, shattering her wrist as she landed on the walkway. Desperate phone calls with insurance agents and arguments with lawyers ate up the next several weeks. Ruth was keen to mention the green and purple package and the saleswoman's references to bringing back more, practically spitting over the phone as she tried to make them see reason. The saleswoman, by contrast, had alleged that green and purple had been the brand's colors for over 10 years, and that any mention of bringing back more was not in the script she had been given. Regardless, Ruth was off the hook by October after untangling miles worth of legalese and chilling out her savings. The mess had left her financially stranded and spiritually wrung out. But she couldn't dwell on all that. Christmas was less than three months away, and she had to start making plans. I think that's enough for now, Ruth said in the present, attempting to shut the oven door. It refused to close. Its hinges were stuck on piles of warped, cluttered cookie sheets and everything else she had stuffed inside it. Humming Silent Night, she extracted a bottle of pine sol from under the sink and emptied it on the floor. The sappy wood smell was like a dagger to her sensitive nostrils, but at least the kitchen didn't reek of mold or feces. I'll be home... For Christmas. She sashayed into the living room with a handle of brandy. And now we wait. She sat on her chair, which creaked and belched up a cloud of spores. For that goddamned ghost. I'm ready, you stinking bitch. I want my family back. Ruth polished off the bottle as the night dragged on, fidgeting in her seat. What if they noticed the horrible state she was in? Or brought up her altercation with the saleswoman? The ghost's perfect Christmas could only go so far, she recalled. She remembered feeling discontent the last time, and that discontent affecting the rest of her family like a virus. She could not pull it off, and did not have enough time to try for a second chance. Fucking bitch spirit. Her hands curled into claws. Midnight on Christmas morning arrived. The hours became minutes. At 3.30 a.m., time slowed to a crawl. Every ticking second was a little blade nicking Ruth's flesh. It was eager to torment her, drag out her imminent meeting with the ghost. Hurry up! She bellowed her voice hoarse and grating. It was 3.45. 3.50. Ten minutes of eternity left. 3.55. The last five minutes of life on Earth as far as she was concerned. Well, I'm waiting, spirit. Ruth shouted at the stroke of 4 a.m., Her skin crawled with prickling heat under her stiff, musty clothes. She shouldn't feel the heat. She should feel the creeping frigidity of the approaching ghost. Is that it, then? You only visit once? Once in a lifetime? Tears poured down her cheeks. I've lived a hundred lifetimes since last Christmas, you lying demon bitch. You have no idea. You never knew what I went through. Ruth stood up, shaking her fist at the clock. Show yourself. Come see me, you fucking coward. She gasped, 
An overwhelming sensation had just come over her, like immersing herself into a pool of ice water. The numbness immobilized her knees, and she sank back into her chair, choking on ethereal nothingness. Someone stepped into the moonbeams, sifting through the window. Someone tall and clad in dark, ornate clothing, its head hidden above the light. Merry Christmas, Ruth Sterling. Merry Christmas, my ass. You finally showed up. Give me my family back. For one more day? Then to let you wallow? In filth for the year to follow? This cannot be the way. This is my Christmas meant to be. How dare you contradict what I think my perfect Christmas is? The spirit shook her head. I have seen this numerous times. The souls I assist become sour after living through their perfect day knowing I give so much to humankind, only to witness its destruction in the following days. It is my curse. Then why do it at all? The spirit sighed. Because some move on. They use their experience to make a difference in every life they touch. Some have suffered just as much as you and they have gone on to become reborn. So that's it then? Ruth said with a hysterical smile. I'm just weak. The ghost remained silent. Is it? No. Then what? Still, the spirit did not answer. Well, you know what? I want to have a forever Christmas with my family. I want to spend the rest of my life with them. I cannot do that. Christmas is but one day in a year. Ruth could only scream, rising from her chair and pulling her hair. And I know this isn't your Christmas meant to be. Why are you contradicting me again? Ruth seethed, a clump of silver hair in her fist. How arrogant of you! You have been festering for months. Hatred and indignation have become ingrained in your very being. You harbor deeper desires, even if you don't wish to admit them. You're lying. But Ruth knew she was only lying to herself. There had indeed been other visions, persistent and nagging, like an itch inside her heart. Dark fantasies of settling unfinished business spun in late night hours. As you are, I can only give you one Christmas meant to be. The clock ticked away as the two women stood in silence. Slowly, The smile returned to Ruth's face. Then you will give me that one. The spirit seemed to fidget as if regretting bringing it up. Tell me precisely what lies in the depths of your heart. Ruth told her. The spirit sighed again. She raised her hand over Ruth's scalp. She hesitated. Know my power, know my grace, and you shall come to see the pure, enduring vision of your Christmas meant to be. Ruth woke up at 8 a.m. on Christmas morning. At first, she thought nothing changed. The house was barren and stinking its foundations groaning against a windstorm that had materialized outside. But she detected no signs of a hangover. Instead, there was a venom in her veins. Vindication and hate. A hellfire that roared in her core and fueled her to get up. 
She thought this had to be it, striding over to the window. She grinned upon seeing what was out on the street. Yes, this is my Christmas meant to be. The sunlight outside was blinding to Ruth, despite the roiling cloud cover. The gusts of wind flecked with sharp little snowflakes threatened to blow her over. But she strode with purpose over to the vehicle parked on the sidewalk. It was in terrible shape. The frame was torqued, the front tires blown out, every pane of glass smashed. Yet she could still recognize it as the big green minivan that had once belonged to her son Thomas. And it would drive. That had been part of her vision. She wrenched the driver's side door open and plopped in the seat. Protruding springs jabbed her rear, but she didn't care. The cabin smelled of burnt rubber and spoiled meat. There was no key in the ignition, but Ruth pressed on the gas pedal and the engine gave a devilish growl. The headlights flared to life like a dragon emerging from its cave black smoke poured from the hood. The passenger in the seat next to her shifted, emitting a charred crunch. Even now, Ruth couldn't bear to look at it. Instead, she stared straight ahead. She closed the door and grasped the steering wheel. Point the way. Navigating the pulverized minivan through the mountain roads took much of the morning. Even though it drove just as well as it would have in life, Ruth still took great caution. She remembered that Christmases meant to be were just setups. The way the rest of the day transpired would depend on herself. She was not about to ruin her chance. Plus, the storm had intensified. The snow was coming in sideways, and the car's fragile frame shuddered in the wind. The horrible weather couldn't break it apart, could it? That wasn't in her vision. No, it had to be coincidental. Complimentary, even. Lord knew vitriol brewed in her heart like a storm already. The passenger occasionally jerked its head, and Ruth obeyed, turning left or right. She still couldn't look at it. She doubted she ever could lay eyes on it, even as Christmas Day would conclude. The mountain road spilled out onto a small highway. The tiny buildings on the sides of the streets were glazed with snow, like little gingerbread houses. Lights and animatronic deer glimmered inertly in their yards. The roads were completely devoid of cars. Everyone was at home with their families, celebrating yet another wonderful holiday. Nothing more would get in her way. In the distance, The trees opened up, and a bridge came into sight. Even from quite far away, Ruth could tell the guardrails were small, not nearly enough to stop a car from toppling over the side. The bridge had to have been old, designed not with the large vehicles of the future in mind. The closer she approached, the clearer she heard the hissing hum of cars below, driving perpendicular to the bridge along the major interstate. Ruth supposed she should have been thankful that, miraculously, no one on the interstate had died from an entire minivan careening off the bridge and exploding. But that just made her family's demise seem all the more ungracious. She slowed to a crawl. The minivan creaked and clunked in response, the black smoke starting to fill the cabin. Ruth had to hunch over the steering wheel to see past the fumes. But in time, she saw it. Saw him. No other cars were coming from either direction. Ruth tapped the brakes, and the minivan shuddered to a stop. The ignition turned off by itself. She got out of the car. The wind was roaring. The snowflakes were like fiberglass on her skin. The clouds above were almost as black as the smoke billowing from the minivan. She walked to the side of the bridge, the brief space between the road and the guardrail. Hey! Who is that? Is it someone there? Help! Ruth grimaced as she approached the voice. I need help! Call 911! And 
suddenly, Ruth was standing over him. The man was wearing only an undershirt and boxers. His bare flesh was studded with goosebumps. He might have been mercilessly ripped out of bed earlier that morning. He was strapped to an office chair, black cables tying his wrists to the armrests. Covering his head was a burlap sack. Who's that? The man strained against the cables. Get this crap off me! Gordon Saunders. The man stiffened. Who are you? The sweet old lady you took everything from. Lady, get this goddamn bag off my face! Ruth snatched the bag off and tossed it aside. The man underneath was doughy and balding, with a prickly stubble and a wide nose. I'm sorry. Can you help me? I don't know what happened to where I'm at. Oh? Ruth's voice trembled with rage. Look around, Gordon. Then tell me you don't know where you're at. Gordon glanced around the bridge over his shoulder. Then he froze. Oh. Oh my god. Wait. Who are you? Why did you bring me here? I didn't bring you here. And who did? Ruth smiled. She watched him struggle harder, but the restraints dug into his pudgy flesh. You're the family, aren't you? Gordon looked up at her. Oh my god. No. I'm so sorry. He gasped, voice strangled with tears. It haunts me to this day. Not a night has gone by, I don't think about it. Please. I'm so, so sorry. All you had to do was use your head. I'm 68 years old, and even I know not to do what you did. You should have plowed through that deer, unless you think a stupid deer is worth more than my family. The man's head dipped forward, his body trembling from sobs. It happened so, so fast. Ruth merely stared down at him. In another life, under different circumstances, she might have taken pity on him. But there was nothing more to offer. She was ruined. All she could do was vomit out the darkness within and lay it upon the shoulders of others. You know what I would really like this Christmas? I would love for you to suffer the way my family did. What did the police report say? Driver self-reported bumps and bruises? No, no, that's not good enough. We're going to draft up a new report. Ma'am, please. I, I don't know what else I can do to tell you how unbelievably sorry I am. This isn't the answer. If you untie me, I'll do anything. I'll donate, help, take penance, anything you want. I want you to dead. You're not gonna do it. You won't. Ruth grinned. No, you're right about that. She stepped away, backing towards the ruined minivan. But they will. They crawled from the wreckage. Burnt, ashen corpses, mangled in manners most obscene. Thomas emerged from the passenger side door, his skull smashed in, molten blood trickling down his scorched flesh. Katie joined him next, lower jaw missing, chest cavity a furnace that made her eviscerated throat glow orange. Next came Stuart, his upper body held up by mere sinews, guts trailing at his feet. Tina and Aiden hauled their way from the rear windshield, their faces burnt and flattened, 
their ribs conjoined and tangled from when they had gripped each other during the fall. Allison was the last to arrive. A monstrous gash ran from her forehead, splitting her mandible down the middle, down her chest and to her thigh. The wound pulsated and oozed, taking rattling breaths. And dangling in her grasp was the charred form of an infant, swinging back and forth with her momentum. They gathered around Ruth, heaving and retching, still emitting smoke. Gordon had frozen again, gaping stupidly at the zombified congregation that had suddenly appeared. They locked their eyes on him, whatever was left of them. They shuffled forward. No. Gordon turned away and heaved in his chair. No! 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 Rasping from the scorched recesses of their throats, they surrounded him. Oh, God! Wake up! Wake up! They gripped his chair, remnants of their tongues lolling from their skulls, emitting sepulchral groans. Holy fuck! Help! Please! Somebody help! All I want for Christmas is you. Gordon screamed as the back of his chair tilted over the guardrail. This is my Christmas meant to be. The undead mob gave one last heave. Gordon Saunders plummeted over the edge, dropping out of sight like a stone. The wind carried his screams for miles beyond. Ruth didn't need to look. The noises were enough. Falling, falling, fall, splat. Then came the blare of a truck horn, the screech of breaking tires, and the gnarly crunch of 18 wheels running over a human body-sized mass. Ruth threw her head back and laughed and laughed and laughed. She shrieked into the storm as the snowflakes became a piercing deluge. The corpses raised their arms and reveled with her. Within moments, her laughter was lost to the storm. The wind threatened to sweep her off her feet. She spread her arms, and a gust caught her like a parasail. She was flying, flying, falling. She was in her chair, in her dark, stinking living room, still laughing her head off. Her lungs hurt. Her heart gave a troubling seize. She couldn't believe it. She had just witnessed the best Christmas ever. And she was back in hell. Back in reality. Yet she was still laughing. Oh, how he had fallen. That dumb look on his face. The noise of that man hitting the asphalt was straight out of a Hanna-Barbera cartoon. The very walls were ringing with her laughter as she smashed her glass of brandy against the armrest. Amber liquid sloshed everywhere, sticky and sweet, but she gripped a particularly gnarly shard and pressed it to her throat. Gotta stop laughing, she told herself between her hoarse, elated shrieks. Gotta calm down. It was like cutting through cookie dough. Warm, rich blood melded with the splattered brandy as she choked and sputtered. Her laughing eventually died down. That was too funny. She spat, holding her throat together to get the words out. Then she let go of the flesh on her neck and slumped in her chair. Within moments, the walls stopped ringing. As she lay in her chair, caught in an eternal sleep, the sun rose on another Christmas morning and families worldwide celebrated their holidays, and still others enjoyed their Christmases meant to be. I hope you enjoyed The Fourth Ghost, as written by Nick Carlson, and performed by Justine Anastasia, Danielle Hewitt, Eric Peabody, Michelle Kane, Olivia Steele, and Nick Goroff. 
You can find more of author Nick Carlson by visiting our website, www.creepypastastories.com, where you can find out more about him, as well as read more of his work. Olivia Steele is a voice actress who loves the spooky side of things. Her talent varies between gameplay, live stream archives, singing, and other voice-related things. You can also hear more of Danielle and Michelle over on the Creepy Podcast at www.creepypod.com. And Eric Peabody hosts Horror Hill right here on our network, airing Thursday nights at 8 p.m. Central Time. Our second tale this evening is written by Richard Morgan and is performed by Jeff Sturdivant and Kevin Barberi. Kids can be awful sometimes, can't they? We will see a prime example of that in our final tale. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Let It Go. There's always a bigger fish. There's always a smaller one, too. I was everything that school bullies loved. Thin, crooked shoulders, dressed by a mother who was never so much as once in touch with fashion. Zero knowledge of how to throw a punch. Glasses thicker than your auntie's thighs. I looked like a buck-toothed praying mantis, okay? I lost track of how many times I got stuffed in lockers, got swirlies in the toilets and all other kinds of standard extracurricular social hazing. Thirteen-year-olds are some of the cruelest human beings on the planet. It always started early, every day on the bus. The big dogs would shack up between two seats that faced each other across the aisle. They would select their targets and dispense pain and misery as they saw fit. How the bus driver never caught on, I have no idea, but they got away with whatever they wanted. I got poked with safety pins and tacks. I got melted milkshakes poured down the back of my collar. I got super glue in my hair. And then there were the good old standard issue beatings, and that was just on the bus. The driver would yell, hey, once in a while. But that was it. You can only imagine what happened throughout the school day. I was so busy being paranoid and watching my back that I went a long time without seeing what was right in front of me. Simple truths, like I wasn't the only person the big dogs picked on. Most of their other prey were still tougher than me. Until one late November, when Jeffrey started riding the bus. He wasn't as small as me. He probably could have crushed me if he sat on me. But he was as sharp as a bag of wet hamsters. Speaking of wet, he pissed himself constantly. You smelled him before you saw him. His squarish glasses had to have been a whole pound heavier than mine. And the letter R was beyond his ability to pronounce. So you know what I did? I started picking on Jeffrey. I did it in full view of the big dogs. Like me, Jeff knew nothing about fighting back. So it was easy to find his seat, muscle my way next to him, and push him into the aisle. The first time I did this was gold. The big dogs looked at me like I had grown another head. Jeffrey's protests sounded more like a pig being led to slaughter than a kid being robbed of his seat. I won't lie. There was an adrenaline rush there. Domination felt good. So I took it a step further. When it was time to get off of the bus, I kneed Jeffrey from behind so that he went down and got trampled by the herd of off-boarding kids. It felt way too good. Literally stomping another person down. I glanced over my shoulder. 
the big dogs were leaning out, watching, still unsure of what they saw. They did make sure to get in some stomps on Jeffrey as he wailed and tried to stand. I was laughing. It was the cruelest laugh I remember ever coming out of me. Being a bully felt good in a really bad way. After a while, I wasn't hurting Jeffrey to get the attention of the big dogs anymore. I was doing it because I enjoyed hurting Jeffrey. Think that's bad? It gets worse. It was like any other lunch period. I was used to the big dogs swooping down and sitting on either side of me so I couldn't get up and run away. And I braced myself for whatever abuse they were packing. Hi, Kyle. The rest of them, about seven total, parroted this greeting. I honestly would have been less terrified if they started messing with my food as usual. They never talked to me before. Especially not the ringleader, James Tate. He was smart, made the girls melt, and was one of the top three cruelest kids in the school. He knew how to leverage all of it, so the simple fact that he was taking the time to talk to me was horrifying. Each of them were close enough for me to count their freckles and nose hairs. That was also close enough for them to smell my raw fear. What's up, guys? Oh, nothing. Just wondering what the deal is with you beating on Jeffrey all of a sudden. you never done that before. I was going to answer, but James cut me off. We've got a job for you. Do it right, and we'll try letting you hang with us. My fear turned to joy, despite the fact that they were still breathing down my neck. All right. What kind of job? We want you to become Jeffrey's best friend and learn everything you can about him. Find out his deepest, darkest secrets. Then, we can tell everyone on the bus in front of him. <laughs> He'll cry for days. Then after that, you're all my friends? Maybe. Depends on how well you do this. For all I knew, they were feeding me a load of crap. But when you're desperate enough, crap can taste like candy. It's a fact of history that during Nazi Germany, some of the prisoners in concentration camps were given a chance to save their own skin by either torturing fellow prisoners or ratting on them. That's how I felt. I was at the bottom of the food chain and finally being thrown a rope. I'd be damned if anyone was going to climb before I did. I found Jeffrey on the bus. He had gotten quiet in recent days. I sat next to him. Hey, Jeff. He looked at me with eyes magnified by his overpowered glasses. Was that how I looked when the guys crowded me at the lunch table? Were they angling me with as much deception as I was angling Jeffrey? I couldn't bear the thought and shoved it aside. I wasn't sure where to go from there, so I went for the direct approach. I'm sorry for being mean to you. My, uh, my hamster died, and grief can really change a man. So, do you want to be friends? Just when I thought his eyes couldn't get any bigger, they did. It was too easy. I was in. I knew that I was in. No! He blasted me with foul, hot breath that made me gag. The guys leaned out of their perches and leered at me. They didn't look happy. Jeffrey looked out the window and ignored me the entire ride. I had to think of something. On the bus ride home, I sat several seats behind Jeffrey. I followed him from a distance when he got off at a stop. He never looked behind him or anything. He led me all the way to his home. It was a house that looked like it was ready to collapse. 
Every coat of paint the place ever had was exposed. Every light inside was yellow and dim. You could smell the place from the sidewalk, and it smelled like Jeffrey. Bad. So I knew where he lived. I ran home so my parents wouldn't get suspicious, but I planned to return that same evening. I inhaled my dinner, ensured my homework was handled, and slipped back outside. It was overcast. The last shred of sunlight was that cold gray glow that November is good at. I found Jeffrey's house and nobody was outside. The next part was going to be tricky. I had to do it without getting spotted by anyone inside or outside the house. I tried to intuit where Jeffrey's bedroom would be. It wouldn't be where I heard the television blaring at max volume. It wouldn't be where I heard two adults in a shouting match. So, that left a couple of windows in the back of the house. I picked the one with the pull-down roller blind that was open by about two inches. I silently gave myself a pat on the back. There was Jeffrey, with one of his secrets on full display. He was playing with a doll. It was the Ice Princess Eliza, no less. The main character of that damn movie, Iced Over, with the catchy music kids are always singing. Nearby was a dollhouse fashioned after Eliza's snow palace. I thought it had to be his sister's or something. But he turned toward it and began playing with it. Dozens of other Eliza-themed toys were in my narrow field of view. And I don't know how I didn't see it sooner. Jeffrey was wearing Eliza pajamas. Jackpot. I borrowed one of my little sister's Eliza dolls. The one that was small enough to fit in a coat pocket. She wouldn't miss it if I had it for just a day. I sat next to Jeffrey on the bus again. As soon as his eyes were on me, I had the Eliza doll out and pretended to play with it. Again, his eyes got huge. But this time it wasn't out of fear or anger. No way! You like Eliza too? He was loud enough for everyone in traffic to hear. Yes, I do. The floodgates were open. Jeffrey would not shut up. His breath created a disgusting miasma as he talked and talked and talked. He prattled about his favorite parts of the Iced Over movie. His favorite part must have been the entire movie because he commented on every single scene and sequence as it played in his head. James and the guys were leering again, but that time, they looked amused. As days passed, I started to wonder if I was the butt of a cruel joke. Every minute Jeffrey could be around me, he was. He talked a mile a second, and it was only ever about Ice Dover and Princess Eliza. I couldn't get that job over with soon enough. Thank God I didn't have to wait long for Jeffrey to invite me over to his place. I had no clue what kind of horrors were waiting for me inside that house. The smell was somewhere between cigarettes and dog poop. A man with sharp cheekbones was passed out on a threadbare couch that may or may not have been soaked with piss. Two toddler-aged children were painting the living room wall with the contents of their diapers. Three or four oversized dogs chased each other through the house like wrecking balls with legs and teeth. And then... There was Jeffrey's room. Jesus Christ. I didn't see half of it when I was looking through his window a few nights ago. There were Princess Eliza posters on the wall. Every shit-smeared pair of underwear tossed on the floor had Eliza's face on them. There were Eliza coloring books, action figures, play sets. Don't even get me started on the drawings. Not only was Jeffrey's artwork of his favorite princess everywhere, 
I caught a glimpse of several pieces that were peeking out from under his bed. I don't think I was supposed to see them. He had zero drawing ability, but I could even tell what was meant to be Princess Eliza Pornography. I will never get his pairing of Eliza and Oleg the Snowman out of my brain. Never. I wasn't sure how I was going to make my home run with James and the gang. Was I supposed to bring them some of Jeffrey's biohazard underwear? His dirty fan art? Take pictures of his room or the house? Let's start a fan club! Huh? What? A fan club! I'll be the president since I'm the biggest fan of Princess Eliza that ever lived. We can have secret meetings with all the other members. The more Jeffrey talked, the more he looked like a televangelist watching a check about to get cashed. Right then and there, the Jeffrey Iced Over Princess Eliza fan club was founded. We wrote out something like a Bill of Rights or a Declaration of Independence, It didn't say much besides how the fan club was the greatest fan club ever and that nobody will ever be better than Princess Eliza and that there will never, ever be a bigger fan than Jeffrey and he will be the president of the fan club for the rest of his life and so forth and so on. It was sad. In the following days, I was catching on to just how sad Jeffrey's life was. Was that his real dad that was always sleeping something off on the couch? Did anyone ever look after the smaller kids? Their diaper art was still on the living room wall. I was finally considering the ethics of what I was going to do, feeding Jeffrey to James and his hounds. I didn't have much where I sat at the bottom of the food chain. Jeffrey had nothing. Less than nothing. My knowledge of Jeffrey and his miserable life kept piling up, and I kept putting off spilling it. I think James and his crew could smell that something was wrong. They cornered me in the lunchroom again. James loomed over me as his lick spits hemmed me in. You've been working on Jeffrey for a long time, man. Got anything for us? I thought fast. Too fast for my own good. Yes. Yes, I do. They all leaned in. Well, come on. Let's have it. I swallowed a lump that went down dry. He thinks we're starting a fan club for Eliza the Snow Princess. It's his favorite thing in the entire world. Jesus, I hate that movie. The red-headed Chris Goss groaned. Mm, but yeah, listen. He thinks I'm going to get everyone I know to join. He wants to get a huge crowd of people in. And he says he's going to be the president and have club meetings and stuff. If you guys join up, you can embarrass him when he gets up to give a speech or something. You'll have a real audience when you do what you do to him. The whole time my mouth was moving, there was a voice in the back of my head telling me that they weren't going to take the bait. My idea was half-baked and twice as stupid. They all looked at each other and then looked at James, who was biting his lip in thought. Okay, where do we sign up? So, I introduced my employers to Jeffrey on the bus as my friend who wanted to join the club. Jeffrey was ecstatic. He started writing a newsletter. He didn't have a computer, so every newsletter copy was handwritten. He would forget what he wrote with each letter, so no two were exactly the same. The Princess Eliza Club Newsletter. Eliza is great. She is pretty. I am the president of a big important club full of people who also think Eliza is the most wonderful princess in the world. Oleg the Snowman is kind of cool too, but Eliza will always be the best. Invite more people to the club so it can get bigger. I will always be the president, nobody else. You'll never believe me, but the guys played along. Their sarcasm with the whole thing was unbearable, but Jeffrey was blind to it. 
He doubled his efforts and made handwritten, hand-colored flyers to invite others into the club. We left them in people's lockers. In a matter of a few weeks, something that was too bizarre to be true happened. Since Jeffrey was constantly writing, he gradually got better at it. Coherent ideas began to gel. His repetitive fanboying slowly turned into something more like essays, and they were surprisingly thoughtful. The Princess Eliza Club newsletter. Are you lonely? Are you sad? Princess Eliza understands you. People are afraid of her and her ice magic. She has probably never felt a warm hug. That can make a person very sad and very lonely. Take the time to think about how our favorite princess understands how you feel when mommy or daddy doesn't give you hugs or love or toys or anything. It's in the cold of our princess that we find the warmest love because love is understanding. Can you believe this shit? James would say in the lunchroom with his lackeys. By then, they were letting me sit with them to discuss how to make Jeffrey's humiliation as awful as possible. But I don't think he noticed just how many people were reading Jeffrey's newsletter. It was all around us. And I saw it in more hands, at more tables, with each new issue. It was undeniable by the time Jeffrey instated uniforms. He demanded that all club members either wear official iced-over clothing or at least wear a sky-blue shirt. This wasn't every single day, just designated ones. Like the newsletter, there were more and more blue shirts. Even James couldn't deny it. He actually started to look a little nervous. He scoffed with his mouth, but he had the eyes of a lion that saw one jackal coming out of the brush, followed by hundreds more. I didn't get too nervous until Jeffrey invited me out to the woods one Saturday. There was a patch of timber near his house, just big enough so you could get lost if you wanted to. It had been snowing, and the cold was just bearable enough for me to humor him. He was pretty worked up about whatever he wanted to show me. The trees were getting thicker and thicker. And just like that, there was a clearing, where boards, buckets, and cinder blocks had been arranged like pews in a church. In front of all of it was a plywood platform. We can have club meetings now! He beamed, his blackened, rotted teeth glistening in the cold. Great. I hope we get a decent turnout. I never should have said that. The first meeting filled the shoddy benches, no problem. Jeffrey wore a Princess Eliza sheet over his clothes like some kind of robe. And when he opened his mouth, the voice of an orator came out. I wasn't sure if I shivered from the cold or his message. Brothers and sisters, our Princess Eliza loves you. Always believe that. Today, I've called you to talk about the Ice Princess's greatest teaching. Let it go. Muffled chuckles came from a few corners, but the majority stared them down. At any time, as long as you want badly enough, you can let go of everything holding you back. Princess Eliza went from being a prisoner to being a powerful princess because she let it all go. She let go of people. She let go of ideas. She let go of possessions and places. If it held her back, she let it go. You have the power of our princess in your own soul. Look inward and see it shimmering like a snowflake on the moon. Do you see it? Do you? There were murmurs of awe and a round of applause. Jeffrey then led the assembly in a chant. Let it go, let it go, let it go. The sheer passion of the crowd made it feel a lot warmer. We were out in those woods at least once a week, and more kids were crammed into the meeting spot. They hung on to Jeffrey's every word, and his message only got darker. He began drawing comparisons between Eliza and death. 
death is cold, just like her embrace. Death is inevitable and permanent, so dying was like going to be in Eliza's arms for all eternity. Don't hold back when faced with the opportunity to be in Eliza's arms. Let it all go. The kids began throwing buckets of water on the trees so they would grow icicles big enough to be spears. They would then brandish them at the meetings like torches and pitchforks. Then, one member died. It was suspected a suicide, but the evidence was inconclusive. Just enough to make you wonder if it was Jeffrey's teachings or not. Each time we met in the woods, the gang that was supposed to move to humiliate Jeffrey looked more and more intimidated. Except for James. He rolled his eyes at Jeffrey more than he rolled his eyes at his teachers. It's a wonder he didn't get caught for it. But he did get caught for something else. It was during another meeting that someone shouted, I'm sick of this shit! The silence was instant. It was James. He was standing up. All eyes were on him, including Jeffrey's. Brother James? I'm done with this. This was all supposed to be a joke. I freaking hate Princess Eliza. I hate Iced Over. It's for babies. Stupid babies. The silence gained weight in a way I can't describe. Jeffrey came down from his platform with his arms held out toward James. You took the oath, my brother. Do not speak against what you have sworn to. Our lady will forgive you if you say you're sorry right now. Get away from me, you piss-stinking retard! James shoved Jeffrey with every bit of strength he had. It sounded like Jeffrey landed hard, even with the cushion of snow. That's when Jeffrey clapped his hands. James looked at him like he was looking at a zoo exhibit. That's also when the boys sitting on either side of James stood up, took their gigantic icicles, and plunged them into James's eyes. It was the kind of choreographed movement that could have only come from days of rehearsal. James fell, crawled forward some distance, leaving a blood trail, and then collapsed for the last time of his life. His killers helped Jeffrey to his feet, who then stood over James's body for a long moment with a sad look in his eyes. He adjusted his glasses. He didn't want to see the light, so he doesn't deserve to see anything at all. Let it go, one boy shouted. Let it go, the entire assembly echoed. All except for James's friends. The remaining six of them became as white as the snow, as if they were the only ones who hadn't seen the execution coming. He is now in Eliza's cold arms, where we will all one day find ourselves. All of my instincts were screaming at me to run, but I didn't. I had to wait it all out and pretend I wasn't surprised. It wasn't easy especially after the same boys that killed James slung the arms of the body over their shoulders and carried him off into the woods. I watched them until they were out of sight. When I turned back to the booming, thundering Jeffrey, his eyes were trained right on me. I thought he'd never look away, but he finally did. It was during a standing ovation that I slipped away, I took a path through the timber that I normally didn't, just in case my absence would be noticed and someone would come looking for me. It was a good idea in theory. I got turned around. My attempt to take one big circle around my normal path got me walking in circles instead. My heart brightened when I heard footsteps ahead of me. Whoever it was, I would tell them to call the police on their phones. The thought perished as soon as I saw the two boys. They didn't have James. I ducked behind a tree just wide enough for my shape. 
I thought for sure they would hear my heart slamming against my ribs. But they passed by without incident. So, I had a decision to make. Should I keep trying to find my own path, or go the direction they came from? I wasn't doing myself any favors, so I followed their footsteps through the snow. I almost wished that I hadn't. Nestled in the timber was a gigantic sewer pipe coming out of a hill. Just visible inside were the soles of James's shoes. The sight of his body was somehow more shocking than that. Left outdoors in a pipe like trash. For the mice and the birds. All because he spoke out against a cartoon character. Only Eliza wasn't just a cartoon character anymore. She was the Grim Reaper. At the top of the hill was a narrow road that must have been closed down, judging by its condition. I picked a direction and followed it. All the while, I felt like there was chilling, icy breath on the back of my neck. I was losing it. I had to make it out of the woods before I became completely unhinged. The wind in the trees started to sound like some of the music from Iced Over. Keep it together, man. Keep it together. I coached myself, trying to focus on the sound of my own voice. The road mercifully opened up to the edge of the timber. A rusty iron gate was chained shut with a padlock blocking entry. I scrambled around it and ran. I didn't dare turn around, because if I saw any blue clothing appearing in the trees... I truly lose it. Since I'd found the road right next to the pipe, I was able to tell the police where James's body was. And it was a good thing. Each time I told my account of things, it sounded like a delusional teenage fever dream. Nobody would have believed me if there wasn't a body. My parents took me, and we moved as soon as the investigation had concluded and Jeffrey was in custody. I think they were trying to preserve their anonymity and their reputations more than anything else. I'm not sure the worst of the problem was solved by moving. I'm in high school now, but I'm starting to see more blue shirts. A very specific shade of blue. And when I see them, the person wearing them is always looking me in the eyes. I don't think Jeffrey is willing to let me go. I hope you enjoyed Let It Go, as written by Richard Morgan and performed by Jeff Sturtevant and Kevin Barberi. You can find more of Arthur Richard Morgan by visiting our website, www.creepypastastories.com, where you can find out more about him, as well as read more of his work. As a reminder, we will begin airing our second weekly episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on December 27, with your amazing host, Paul J. McSorley presiding. On to the shows... Longtime resident Otis Jiry has his very own show here on our network, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, which you can hear every Sunday night. We also have Eric Peabody's Horror Hill, a podcast dedicated to some of our deeper and darker tales. We hope you check him out. And Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Fridays, featuring some southern, down-home horror. And don't forget to check out Fear from the Heartlands archives, featuring more than 120 episodes. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. 
next segment, final sign-off. I'm your host of the evening, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. See you next Monday. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.